My name is H.M. Wangabalsi. I'm a corpsman in the Navy. I joined about 10 and a half years ago, and I'm currently with Elite Frogs as their medical asset. Um, a corpsman is the enlisted part of the uh, Navy that um, deals anything medical from taking vital signs to having duties of a physician's assistant. There's multiple areas that we can go. Um, there's multiple schools that we can go to. You can go to uh, jungle warfare medicine, um, high altitude medicine, mountain warfare medicine. Um, they'll teach you tactical combat casualty care. Pretty much how to work in all types of environments, austerior and, and local. That's, uh, <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm talking to you now. So yeah, that's, well, Andrew, with your expertise and your experience, um, I think that you have a lot more to say than I do as in this arena. So it, and I am genuinely interested because what you have to say could quite possibly keep me alive. But I'm Hazen Adele. I am a Spokane boy as well. And uh, right now I'm working with National Geographic. I think we're in our seventh or eighth season of um, programming where the show that we're mostly working on is called Primal Survivor. And that's a show that is about uh, indigenous and, and traditional living people uh, all around the world, typically in the most remote areas of the world, um, because those are the people that they can't just go to the grocery stores or anything like that. They're yeah. living off of the land. And um, because they're so remote, they've been able to keep a lot of their traditions alive. So this, this program um, is viewed internationally and, and it's kind of great because it's really, it's my passion. Yeah, I've been doing this sort of thing since I was 19, but um, oh really? Yeah, yeah. So just just showing what all these traditional people are doing to raise their families, how they're living off the lands, some of the hardships, and I think it's uh, for the viewer with a discerning mind, it's kind of nice to compare and contrast the two cultures and lifestyles, but it's also makes you uh, maybe reflect on some of the things that could use improvement in our Western society and also maybe um, just a little bit of a reality check not to take for granted what we do have. Oh, absolutely. So, um, yeah, myself as a civilian need to know more about all of the different avenues and the, and the things that you guys bring to the table to keep the world turning, really. Yeah, so that's that's incredible what you do. The um, I'm actually stationed with the Leap Frogs right now and, and our job is to... We parachute, we're a parachute demonstration team and we go to high populated areas and kind of demonstrate just one of the capabilities. It's made up of a uh, SEAL SWIC, um, EOD, Navy Diver, a couple of parachute riggers, and myself, and uh, as the medical coverage for them. And so we parachute in and we show what we're capable of and that's just one slice of it. Um, we travel all around the country, not the world, <laughs> but the country. And uh, planning is one of the biggest things that we do. You know, all of us have have to plan where we're going to jump, uh, what the temperature is going to be, how big the landing area is going to be. Uh, for me, it's what medical assets do I have at hand? Uh, how close is you know a trauma center if something should happen? You know, always plan for the worst, hope for the best. Um, the types of injuries that I would see would be kind of blunt trauma to somebody, broken bones. Um, so I'm set up, my bag personally is set up with um, musculoskeletal injuries, uh, fluid resuscitation, stuff like that. But we spend months on planning. And so mm -hmm. I can imagine, you know, going into a jungle, what, what that might be like for you. It, do you plan your medical or is it just a collaboration of just everyone working together? And Well, I, we, when I, when I travel, I have so much more to, I have so many more questions for yeah, you and so let's go back to there, but I'll answer your question now. Um, so as, as we're filming now, before I was doing this stuff on my own when I was 19 and, and, uh, the advantage that I had, it was that I was incredibly naive. I went with a passion for wildlife and I went to the most remote places I could find because that's where the wildlife still are. And then that was where I got exposed to the traditional people that are living alongside these sort of environments. Um, 
But yeah, at 19, out of high school, coming out of Spokane, I was a complete greenhorn and I had to learn the hard way about how to take care of yourself in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, here we are close to 30 years later and I've learned a few things along the way and realized how important it is to glean information from someone like you. Um, but because every day when we're out there, we're confronted with new challenges medically. Um, but right now, the current situation is, is as we're filming now, uh, we typically have a film crew of six other people. Um, they're experts in their field from all over the world, but we come together. And then there might be also additional in-country staff that's going to facilitate transportation permitting um in some places protection even you know okay Again, and and um and so there's that to make a film and then they pretty much set me on my own where i'm alone a lot of times and then they catch up with me as best they can yeah um from my own agenda i want to be there anyway i want to be with the native people i want to be with the animals but uh those people need to make a television show so i have to play the game Oh, um, but I think the biggest thing that I learned, well, the, the first thing that I learned was how severe and rampant infections are, especially in the tropical world. When I was 19 and I first started traveling on my own, yeah. I was living in Ecuador and, you know, again, super naive, thinking I could do it all. And I just brought my camping gear that I had in, in high school, but I was out there in the environment for weeks and weeks on end. Oh, wow. And, um, and what I what happened is, is there, there's tropical, they're called chiggers. They're like a mine, like tiny little mite. Some people call them cooties, <laughs> but they're, uh, uh, they're, they're like a, almost like a teeny tiny tick. But when they lay eggs in your skin, uh, the, the itching is severe, the most intense, torturous itch you've ever experienced and if you go down they have them down south south in the united states as well i think texas uh, has during, yeah chigger season chiggers are just horrible things and so you'd wind up scratching yourself and then you abrade your skin just like scratching a mosquito mm -hmm. bite and usually when you're in the states you just you know it's just a little scab and it's you know it's not a big deal you know you just get cuts and bruises all the time yeah, yeah and we're in this in pretty dry environment here in in Spokane so things heal up and except in the jungle it's so humid that scabs never dry and then you go to those places that are the they're the pinnacle of biodiversity in animals plants mm -hmm. bugs and snakes and germs so any little open wound you're getting all that biodiversity <laughs> trying to eat you back yeah and uh and so yeah, you just you're you're kind of involved in an environment where you're just being attacked by germs and bacteria, and pretty soon, just like a little cut or an abrasion on your on your finger, um, starts to have like a little pustule, and you think, oh, that's fine, you know, and then you squeeze the pus out, not to get too dramatic, but then no. the next day it that infection grows a little bit, a little and then red the infection flag. grows yeah. again, and then pretty soon you have this big ulcer what it's called and then that yep. bacteria starts to become systemic so then any other little scratch like in a fever and it starts moving around right and then everything anytime you damage your skin that infection goes to that area and so pretty soon you're this big festering wound and um yeah when i was 19 i got in a situation like that and my legs i can remember my my foot was just it was all puffy you know because that a oh, lot really? of well, a lot of my scratches were around my ankles and you could just, you could stick your ankle. finger into the flesh of your foot and it would stay there and then it stays there this dense hitting edema yep <laughs> okay yeah not a good thing right so what is it's <laughs> lymph fluid mostly right lymph and <laughs> yep, absolutely so yeah okay it's, so trying to filter all that gunk out of there um and so did you end up needing antibiotics or how did you go about? <laughs> well, this is, so this is, this is all the things that I wish I would have known when I was 19, but, mm -hmm. um, I went to the, to the town cause I couldn't be out in the wild anymore. I was realizing, okay, 
I'm gonna have to go back. This is bad. Like, yeah. it's not getting, it's progressively getting worse, not showing any sign of getting better. And I was walking around and I was pretty much barefoot because <laughs> I lost my shoes a long time ago. And I was walking around in town, but that's not too unusual. And there was an old woman and in Spanish, she looks at me and she goes, what are you doing with your feet like that? They're infected. You silly boy, pretty much, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and she goes, why aren't you taking care of yourself? And I was like, well, you know, I've been, you know, I have bad dean and I have a couple of things like that. And uh, she said, well, here's what you need to do. You need to take this plant. And literally, it was a plant that was sticking out of the sidewalk. She took, tore it out. It was called Tiatina. That was Tiatina. the indigenous name. Okay. And she said, get it, get scolding hot water, put as much salt as you can in that water with the tiatina and then dip your foot in it for as long as you can and take it out and do it again. And you, you do that a routine throughout the evening. And I will say that for the first time in weeks, the next day I had a scabs on those infections. And so um, there was no antibiotics there, but that's how, and then, you know, I stayed in town for a while tried out everything, tried to get better. Yeah. Um, but now I realize um, that was my first exposure to it. Th mm -hmm. Throughout the 30 years of doing that exact same thing, living in the jungle and as wild as things get, I have come to the reality check of understanding and the maturity to know that antibiotics save lives and you don't mess around. If we were to travel, we look at anywhere in the world, uh, as a military, we'll look at what's endemic for that, that area of operation. Mm -hmm. And we'll actually, again, if malaria is a big one, we'll prescribe, um, doxycycline as a, as an antibiotic that'll fight it and, or premiquin, which are both antibiotics. Um, mm -hmm. fact, I mean, malaria kills roughly over a million people a year it makes, uh, mosquitoes the deadliest, deadliest animal in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, a lot of people tell me, oh yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I don't need any of that malaria stuff. You know, I, I don't need, well, they, they also don't understand that millions of people die. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Absolutely. From malaria. And it's, it, yeah, it's one of the leading causes of death. And, and, um, it's, I just, again, from like my, my experience, we as Westerners with our, um, high quality of health, typically, or hygiene or access to medicine we take our health for granted I, so i had questions for you so then um yeah what's what's your advice for myself and everybody else for when they're traveling and and especially in tropical areas where oh yeah so um anytime if if i were to go somewhere in a different country um again we we look at what pests are endemic to that area and what what can kill you what we look at is what will kill you the fastest what to pay attention to for example um in kuwait they have fat-tailed scorpions you know we don't have them here i i caught plenty of those and um they're they're a neurotoxin and you know next thing you know if you get stung by one and it's an actual venomous sting your diaphragm gets paralyzed and that's your breathing muscle. So that's, that's, that's no good. And so right. um, they do have anti-venom for that. Uh, so we look at that and as a corpsman, you know, we have our med bag when we go out and that's about it. You want to find where the closest anti-venom is or where we go, there will be that kind of stuff set up within the time frame that you have to get help. Um, mm -hmm. But again, we'll have different medical assets will have helicopters if we need. So mm -hmm. from a standpoint where you're at, I would definitely carry those medications. I wouldn't take them all the time unless you actually need them type of situation. Mm -hmm. um, the, it's funny that you mentioned Giardia. Cause that's, that's a big one, especially any country. I mean, even traveler's diarrhea, you know, mm -hmm. uh, what else could I say? I would, well, you're, you're talking about fat-tailed scorpions, which are considered the, the most venomous scorpion in the world. There's a few thousand different species of scorpions, and we actually have scorpions native to Spokane, which is really, really? interesting. Okay. Yeah, 
Yeah, I didn't know that. yeah, you can find them a lot, like in Airway Heights. You, okay. You, you see a lot of them in the drier areas. Yeah, they're really cool. So you can find little scorpions. I found one in my house on the South Hill one time. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I was I was putting on my jammies, and there was one that was mixed right in with my plaid on my flannel, flannel oh, gym. Yeah. When I was with the Marines, one of the best things you could do is you know every day change your socks. It's a it's a going joke with uh, corpsmen, we're always saying drink water, take Motrin and change your socks. But it's, Motrin is one of the biggest things we hand out as an analgesic, but changing your socks is a real thing. Let your feet breathe, let them dry out and, you know, clean, cleanliness yeah. is a huge thing. And when you're in an environment where you're at, you can't always do that. Right. So what I do is since I've, I've pretty much been barefoot since I was 19 because I learned from the people, the locals, is they don't have access to shoes and boots and they've been living, humans in those areas have been living since the earliest man mankind, you know. It, we're meant to walk barefoot in some places. We're not meant to be barefoot on pavement and on sidewalks, but in the forests, you know, we can, but we have to be conditioned to it. So yeah, conditioning like not only means like calluses and you build up a, a fat layer on the bottom of your feet to cushion. It's amazing, the body's so incredibly adaptive. Oh, but there's also just a way of learning how to walk. And, you know, I'm, I've been doing it and wanna be like those indigenous guys that I watched that have been like it all day. And I'm still in awe and inspired, but it's so liberating to be able to walk through the forest and do everything and work and do everything without ever wearing shoes and it's if you can be to that jedi level yeah and that's awesome <laughs> it's um, i am not like that but i do i do see the advantages because if i get trench foot i can't perform either so mm -hmm. but but the risk is yes my feet get constantly cut up they constantly get thorns in them yeah. um and then snake bite is a huge concern so um especially walking in at night i am very very cautious and if i have a flashlight you know i'm i'm i walk three times slower and look everywhere i go yeah. and uh yeah like i said we don't have we don't have antivenoms so snake bites um, were a big thing um with and i've seen the literature change on that you don't want to use a tourniquet you know you don't want to lance it and try to suck out the poison you want to keep your heart rate as low as possible, so stop what you're doing. Um, lower, hopefully it's you know a limb, if it comes to that, but keep it below your heart, so so it kind of um, keeps the blood out away from your heart. You don't want to elevate it or anything. Keep it below. Keep it below your heart. Okay. Below your heart, yes. So you don't, you know, all the blood doesn't rush back in. Uh, Is it good to lay down? Uh, you can lay down, but I I would recommend sitting. If okay. you can sit, just sit um, and keep that affected limb lower. Uh, take off any watches, jewelry, clothing that might constrict because it could swell up. If you have a way of marking the site or uh, the edema that will follow, you know, the swelling and the redness, you can mark it and mark what time it was bit. And then you can note how fast it's swelling. That might help uh, any providers that, you know, might be there later on um and then honestly uh it's it's get medical help as soon as possible in order should to should you ice it so they say don't don't ice it or no heat or anything they could they say um uh you want to immobilize it if it is your arm you know a, a sling and swath immobilization and uh they they legit legitimately say just you know get medical help as soon as possible okay the, uh you know, some of the stuff has changed. It used to be, and don't do this by any means, it has changed, but it, it used to be, you know, put a tourniquet on and restrict the blood flow enough to where, you know, you don't have a distal pulse and then loosen it to where you do have a distal pulse and that'll stop the lymph fluid from flowing back, but you still have, you know, arterial flow. That is no longer, no longer in play. Um, okay. How so, about, um... How about um, anti-inflammatories? Would that be good to have or not? You can take anti-inflammatories, uh, obviously not too much. Um, no, I 
doubt you're gonna have any narcotics for pain or anything. You're just gonna have to endure the pain. Um, if it is a neurotoxin, what I told, what I was prepared for uh, in Kuwait was um, because it's a neurotoxin and again, your diaphragm is one of the first things to be paralyzed. And that's why they say like, I believe a cobra is also a neurotoxin. And so that's a neurotoxin, that, that's an interesting point. So that there, there's about three different kinds of poisonous snakes out there mm -hmm. of the hundreds of species of snakes that are poisonous, but there's, you've got three classes. So you've got neurotoxins, yep. which are usually in the cobra and coral and mm -hmm. mamba family. So those are the elapids. Yep. And then, um, and then you've got the hemotoxins, which are the vipers. So those are, um, Rattlesnake. rattlesnakes mm -hmm. and bushmasters and yeah. things like that so those are the two primary ones there's a couple other ones like but uh you can probably talk briefly about those those two different kinds yeah so yeah. For, uh, for, the, for the neurotoxins it, it a little like kind of layman's it, it'll it'll uh affect the way your nerve impulses talk to each other so in essence it'll end up making that not available so um, your diaphragm is is paralyzed and that's your breathing muscle and so um, a bag valve mask you know assisted ventilations are one of the best things that you can do in that case while you're waiting for um, any any help uh, is if, if somebody can't breathe you have to breathe for them so if you have okay. oxygen in a bag valve mask um, you can um, assist and hope you know it wasn't it wasn't a lethal dose and and you can go from there but even if you are assisting with ventilations and they are breathing properly they're still you know it, it'll attack the cardiac muscle and so um and it could eventually lead to you know ventricle fibrillation and and you know eventually death if it, if it did come to that but it's it typically you know, heart attack and it you know, paralyzes the diaphragm as well yeah. so you can't breathe it's yeah. an ugly way to go uh, so in that way tackle those problems yeah absolutely so yeah you uh you breathe for them now i had a marine get get bit he was a recon marine and he got bit in his uh right above his achilles tendon he stepped off of a oh. rock on the north side of camp pendleton and he came in and his, his whole leg was swollen his whole leg up to his upper thigh was just massive um excruciating pain so you know we were able to give him morphine and um uh because it was a catalidae a pit viper is a rattlesnake um, we gave him Crofab and at the time it was $5,000 a vial and, mm. uh, ended up getting 33 vials. So it's a uh, very, wow. yeah, the preloading dose of that is eight vials. So I think it's six, it's either six or eight vials in IV. Oh form. my gosh. And, and so, I had no idea. Yeah. It's no joke. Snake bites or, I mean, it's, you know, life or limb. So you know, probably shouldn't come to it, but it's it's very hard to find if if you get bit, you're obviously going to need the help, but the bill that follows is is excruciating. Um, wow. One thing, one thing I also learned is uh, they're not always effective. Yeah, yeah, you're right. They are not always effective, and and if if it's not, you know, if 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 it's not an endemic. Uh, or if it's if it's something that's not local to that area, then chances mm -hmm. are they're not going to carry it. Uh, I had mm -hmm. uh, one patient once. This is uh, when I was working at the hospital, because uh, corpsmen could go anywhere. They, I mean, anywhere where there's Marine or Navy, there's going to be medical assets, and they're guaranteed to have a corpsman there. And so, um, I was working in the ICU once, and uh, this lady, she moved here from I think. I forgot where, but she was handling an Egyptian death stalker, the scorpion. Mm -hmm. And she had it with tongs. She wasn't licensed to have it or anything, but she had it with tongs and it kind of flipped up and it ran up her arm and it mm -hmm. stung her like six or seven times. They looked like bee stings. They were non-venomous stings, but had that happened, that would have been real bad because it's not, you know, a local pest that we deal with. And so there's mm -hmm. no anti-venom here. There's right. I think the closest one was in Florida for some reason. They they had the end, but that's mm -hmm. it. no. That's knowing your surroundings and planning for it is absolutely paramount. One issue, one thing that I wanted to uh, uh, ask you about was appendicitis. 
so appendicitis, I mean, if it's caught early enough in a hospital setting, you know, they have um, a lap ap lap, yeah, laparoscopic ap appendectomy, and that's where they kind of go in and um, they kind of blow you up with CO2 and they, they remove your appendix in pieces. And I mean, patients will show up with periumbilical pain. They'll come in, they will be diagnosed and they'll have the surgery, they'll recover and they'll be out the same day. I had two patients back to back, two days, um, have that. So there's some simple tests you can look for it. Um, rebound tenderness is one of the biggest ones we're taught to look for. And that's if, you know, your appendix is uh, right lower quadrant, right? So you have your, right okay. here, you have your right upper quadrant, your left upper quadrant, left lower and right lower quadrant. So if you okay. push on it and the pain goes away and then you let go and it's excruciating, that's one, one wow. of the signs that you can test for appendicitis. Um, from that, I would have to uh, look into what the guidelines are on that. Um, if you do have questions on on certain things uh i can recommend a website that i still go to and it it uh it talks about um what they do is they it's it's run by the army actually and um everyone from like it, wars or hospitals or anywhere they kind of compile this information and look at you know the statistics and ways to go about it and it's a joint trauma center clinical practice guidelines and so um you might be able to find some information there it's, it's in the public actually it's a military website but they'll talk about you know if you're sitting on a patient for you know certain hours like prolonged field care type of situations mm -hmm. If I ever have questions, I can I can always result to that. And if they don't have questions, that you know, I um, I'll do the research or I'll ask you know physicians that I work with. It's incredible. I can't wait to see uh, some more episodes. Yeah. Well, I I uh, this has been a feather in my hat to be able to talk with you and be more involved with what's happening, at least in Spokane area with with the Navy. And I, I hear that you're going to try to throw me out of a plane one of these days. Yeah, we would love to. Uh, we're going to be in Boise towards the end of the next month, I believe, right? August. Yeah, we'll be in Boise in August, but uh, I'll reach out to you. I, I can look you up and I'll reach out to you and we'll kind of collaborate something. And I'm more than happy if you and, and you want to take your girlfriend or your parents or all okay. three of them, we can make that happen. That'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna, I think we're gonna, we're gonna have to sign off, but the relationship will still continue, Andrew. So this Absolutely. is great. Okay. Hey, it's good Thank talk, you, guys. Bye-bye.